we are discussing NMR spectroscopy. We have already discussed the basics. Today, we will see how far we can get in discussing how NMR spectra are actually recorded. You might be wondering why we have this uh, colored wedge going around increasing in size and all. Let us see if we can get there today. If not, we will get there tomorrow. But so far, this is what we have discussed. We have introduced the only NMR spectrum that we are going to show you in this course. Of course, there is no guarantee that we will not show you or we will not ask you to sketch uh, some other NMR spectrum in NSEM that we can do. But what we have said is we have understood that first of all, when you have a bare proton in a magnetic field, then the energy between alpha spin and beta spin, uh, th there is an energy difference that uh, comes in between alpha spin and beta spin. And then we realize that when we talk about molecules, we are not really dealing with bare nuclei, bare proton or bare 13 C or whatever. We are dealing with nuclei that are encased in an electron cloud or charge cloud. And as we have discussed, when we subject this molecule to a magnetic field, then this electron charge cloud sets up a reaction field, even the Shusnato does not seem to believe it. And this reaction field depends on what kind of uh, whether it is CH2 or the, whether it is OH, whether it is CH3 or what. So, different protons in a molecule get subjected to a different amount of shielding and consequently different amount of uh, B effective, effective magnetic field. How much shielding depends on what kind of chemical environment it is in. That is why NMR spectroscopy becomes such a useful tool for chemists because now by looking at NMR spectrum, you can understand what is the molecule you are dealing with. NMR spectroscopy is I think the most useful and widely used uh, kind of spectroscopy in chem not only in chemistry, but also in uh, biology. Uh, a lot of biologists actually use NMR because it gives them uh, a lot of information. So, uh, after discussing the quantum mechanics, let us see if we have time, we will talk about 2D NMR and pulse decoupling and all that. But I do not know, I am not sure whether we have time for that yet. But what we have learned for ethanol is this, because of this different kind of shielding that we talked about, there are three groups of lines because there are three kinds of protons, CH3, CH2, OH. And then we said that the areas under each of these groups of lines gives us the relative abundance of the different kinds of protons. So, just by looking at the areas in since this case is uh, a little simple, looking at the areas, we can tell that this is for OH, this is for CH2 protons, this is for CH3 protons. Okay? But why do we have a fine structure in the lines? The answer is the fine structure comes due to coupling between the different protons. And that is what becomes, uh, that is what provides an even more, uh, a different angle, a more insight, a little bit of more insight into uh, the structure of the molecules. Because looking at the patterns of couplings as we are going to see in the next few minutes, we can understand what kind of uh, groups of proton it is, whether it is CH2 or CH3 or what. And this is the discussion we have done about coupling. We have understood that alpha alpha and beta beta spins, their energies get increased as a result of coupling from the uncoupled scenario. And for alpha beta and beta alpha, these their energies are lowered from the uncoupled scenario as a result of coupling. We are going to do a little more detailed treatment of this uh, starting tomorrow or Wednesday whenever we can get to it. But for now, this is the picture and we said that as a result, uh, when we have an AX kind of a situation, AX means we have two groups of, uh, not groups, we have two protons. We des designate one as A and the other as X and we have two protons of very different chemical shift. Okay? So, in this situation, the spectrum you expect is instead of one line, you expect two lines for A and two lines for X and separation between these two lines is G as we have discussed in the last day. So, now if we, discuss, if we extend it a little more, suppose we have AX2 kind of situation, okay? AX2, that means I have one proton of one kind and I have three protons, uh, sorry, two protons of another kind. Uh, what is a good example? Something like this.
let us see let us not spend too many elements let us just work with chlorine hydrogen and so here what do we have we have one proton of one kind and we have two protons of another kind a x 2 or uh, a 2 x depending on uh, what the relative uh, chemical shifts are. In this case what will happen? Let us think of uh, the A resonance ok. Think of the coupling of A with one of the x's first. Of course, coupling it is not as if uh, there is a coupling with one x first and with the second x after that it is not sequential, but it is a little easier for us to understand if you think sequentially that is all. So, now first consider coupling of A with one of the x protons you are going to have a splitting like this separation will be j. Now, consider the coupling of, of A with the second x each of these will split into two lines right this separation will be j this separation will be j. So, I hope it is not very difficult to understand that the lines in the middle they actually come together and they will merge and you are going to have a line that is uh, double the intensity of the other two lines. So, when you have A x 2 the line of A is a triplet and relative intensities are 1 is to 2 is to 1. I think for chemistry students it is not any new information. Shobana are we ok? All right. This is uh, very simple. Now, in case of x what will happen? Only one A is there that is coupling. So, it gets split into 2 alright. Is that all? Is there a question at this point of time? If you do not ask a question I will. There is a question that should come to our minds at this point of time unless we already know a lot of about NMR. The question is this what happened? We are saying that A couples with x, x couples with A. So, we are talking about the effect of the A resonance of, of coupling with x on A resonance coupling with A on x resonance. What about coupling between the two x nuclei? That should also happen and consequently there should be a splitting, but those of us who know, know that that does not happen. Why not? Why is it that we consider coupling of A with x, x with A, but we do not consider coupling of x with x? Those are equivalent, so those are equivalent, so they do not couple with each other. Why? You are right, but my question is why? So, let us see if we can get there as well. When we do our discussion of uh, quantum mechanical discussion of this problem, hopefully we will be able to understand why it is that two A's do not couple if you can get that far. I am not sure if we can, we will see. So, consequently A x 3 what will happen in A x 3? For the first coupling split into 2. Now, consider coupling with the second x this will split into 2 this will split into 2. So, you get 1 is to 2 is to 1, but that is not all there is one more x further splitting will be there. So, 1 2 here what will be the intensities? This is already 1 is to 2 is to 1. So, basically this becomes half right when this splits into 2 intensity will become half 1 will come here. So, this is the kind of intensity you will get 1 is to 3 is to 3 is to 1 very easy math you can work out by itself. The crux of the matter is if you have A x n kind of situation, then the number of lines and the intensity of lines for a spin half system is given nicely by this Pascal's triangle. I hope we have all encountered Pascal's triangle in class 11 or earlier. So, this Pascal's triangle is something that shows up in NMR spectrum as well ok. So, that is uh, the beauty of science right. Mathematics arises everywhere and you can actually express everything even biological phenomena mathematically. There is a book I forgot by whom uh, which kind of discusses why is it that mathematics uh, appears naturally in everything around us. Unfortunately, I have forgotten the name of the book as well as the author. If I remember I can tell you uh, it is an interesting phenomenon all right. So, much for coupling. Now, uh, in what we have discussed so far we can uh, work out some simple problems. This is something that I had talked about briefly in the previous class I think. If I ask you what is the transition frequency in hertz for protons when the magnetic field used is 11.7 tesla, what is it at 21.1 tesla? Can you tell me? What I have to give you of course, is gamma proton. What is gamma? 
gyromagnetic ratio or magnetogyric ratio that is an intrinsic property of the uh, nucleus that is given. So, how will we find out what is frequency going to be? We know the expression for Lamar frequency we can work it out and the answer we get are these. So, 11.7 tesla for 11.7 tesla the frequency is 498 megahertz which is approximately 500 megahertz for applied magnetic field of 21.1 tesla the frequency is 898 megahertz approximately 900 megahertz. So, as we had discussed earlier this is the meaning of this 400 megahertz, 500 megahertz, 900 megahertz NMR machine. It essentially tells you in a little roundabout fashion how big the magnet is. So, you can see when you go from 500 megahertz machine which we have in chemistry to 900 megahertz machine which you do not have anywhere in this institute there is one in TIFR then the magnetic field has to increase from 11.7 tesla to 21.1 tesla almost double and the cost does not double it goes to the power of something it is a power law. So, so that is what it is you use a bigger magnet you get higher resonance frequency and as we have discussed earlier a higher resonance frequency also means uh, better resolution ok. We will come back to this topic later as well. Now, another small little calculation that is going to be extremely helpful in our subsequent discussion is I have alpha spin I have beta spin ok. I have applied magnetic field. So, there are two levels and there is an energy difference that comes in as a result of the applied magnetic field. So, I should be able to calculate what is the ratio of population right. Will we have more uh, nuclei in the higher state or will we have more in the lower state? We should have more in the lower state, but what will be the ratio? So, what I am telling you is what is the ratio of number of spins in the alpha state to that in beta state at room temperature when uh, I use a 500 megahertz machine 11.7 tesla magnet for proton ok. I will give you the answer the answer is this n alpha I do not know why I have written a and b n alpha by n beta turns out to be 1.0000 it is actually very close to 1 and it is not surprising because if you remember what we said yesterday is uh, we are accustomed to working with big energy gaps right. We had talked about UV bays then we talked about vibrational levels those are fairly large energy gaps. Now, we are working in the uh, lowest lowest energy side of the spectrum right we are talking about radio waves radio frequency. So, energy gaps are really small since energy gaps are really small what will happen is at low at room temperature itself significant number of nuclei will actually be there in the excited state, but excited state can never have more population in the ground state that much will be ensured ok. So, this is the number 1.0000 8056. So, this is the number for 11.7 tesla magnet. What happens if I use a 21.1 tesla magnet? Should this ratio be more or less? Less. Thank you for falling in the trap. More. I am talking about n alpha by n beta, it is already more than 1. So, if you increase the energy gap, more and more nuclei will actually be in the lower energy level, all right. So, be careful, even if it is a multiple choice question it is very easy to go wrong especially when you have ratios it is A is to B or B is to A very easy to get confused, but that kind of changes the answer on its head. So, this is something that we are going to use shortly. Now, let us go on to what we promised to do at the beginning of this lecture. Let us just think what is there inside an NMR spectrometer that has been uh, the way we have been handling this throughout the course. Not only have we talked about the uh, mathematics of it or physics of it. We have also tried to understand how a measurement is done what is there inside the machine this will not be any exception. So, inside a NMR spectrometer of course, the one big difference between NMR spectroscopy and say UVB spectroscopy or uh, IR spectroscopy is that the energy gap is not there in the uh, system. You have to create it. You have to create it by using this 11.7 tesla or 21.1 tesla magnet. Okay. So, of course, you need a magnet. Uh, how many of us have seen an NMR tube? 
almost everybody. So, NMR tube is it as thick as this or thicker or thinner? Thinner, very thin. It looks like a uh, it looks like a test tube on diet. Hmm, thin, thin, right? That's what I said. Test tube on diet. Test tube hai, lekin khata pita nahi hai. So it's really very narrow. Okay. So that is where the test tube goes in. This is what we have drawn here. It's a fairly accurate, uh, scaled-up representation of the NMR tube. You, so when it goes in, that is subjected to the strong magnetic field. And then what do you need? You need light, and you need a detector. Now, once again, don't forget when we say light, we mean radio frequency. Okay. What is a uh, what is a uh, very easily available device in which radio frequency is used? radio. Radio frequency is used in radio. How difficult is that to give that answer? Radio. How many of us have opened a radio set? And you are not so young that you have not seen a radio set at home when you are children. How many of us have been sufficiently adventurous to have opened a radio set? I am not asking whether you could put it back or whether it worked after that. How many of us have seen the inside of a radio set? Manthan has, right? So, if you open a radio set, you have opened a radio set, you said, what have you seen inside? There is a big magnet? Okay. Okay. But there is the, did you see there is this rod and some wire coiled on it? What is that? Can, can anybody tell me? What is this coil that we see inside radio set? Achha, we are not talking about prehistoric radios. So, discharge tube does not arise here, transistor set. I am talking about the, so that is the antenna. Any, if you open a radio, you will see that there is a coil that is essentially the antenna. So, that is how you receive radio waves and that is how you transmit radio waves also by using antenna. An antenna essentially is a coil of wire perhaps around a core. Okay. So, you do not have this light falling on it as such. So, what you have is this where the tube goes in, there are two coils. One coil is the light source, RF source, radio frequency source. The other coil is the detector, okay, antenna. One is source, one is antenna. So, things are a little different when you talk about uh, radio frequency here. All right. And then, of course, your frequency generator, which tells you at which frequency the uh, RF will, uh, uh, what frequency RF will be generated. That is also pretty much what you have inside a radio transmitter. And then you have the recorder, detector, all those things. Uh, the detector is already shown here. Then you have the recorder. Now, this is uh, a very rudimentary picture of a classical uh, NMR spectrometer. Okay. What is called a CW or continuous wave NMR spectrometer. Now, the term CW is uh, nothing new for us in this course, I hope. We have talked about femtosecond spectroscopy. So, we know very well what is CW, what is passed. Now, in conventional CW NMR, there are two ways in which you can achieve resonance. Remember, there are two things, right? On left hand side, you have the frequency nu L. On right hand side, you have something multiplied by uh, the magnetic, magnetic field B0, right? Or B effective, whatever you want to say. Now, one way of achieving resonance is by changing the frequency. You work with a fixed magnetic field and keep on changing the frequency. At one particular frequency, if you talk, go back to our example of ethanol, CH3 protons will come into resonance. At another frequency, CH2 will come into resonance. At another frequency, OH proton will come into resonance. It is as simple as that. That is one way. Can you tell me what is the other way of doing it? If I suppose I do not want to change the frequency, I want to work with one radio frequency 500 megahertz of whatever it is 400 megahertz, 900 megahertz. Then how can I achieve resonance? I do not have many radio frequencies, yes, Kajal? By changing the magnetic field. Is it easy to change the magnetic field? Is it difficult to change the magnetic field? It is actually easy. It is not difficult. Because all you need is, you need that big fat magnet, 11.7 Tesla. But do not forget, the sigma is not very large, right? So, effective magnetic field is not very different from B0. 
you have to just change B0 by small amount. So, what you can have is you can have the big magnet and you can have a an electromagnet along with it. Electromagnet as you know as you increase the current magnetic field will go up right. Is it easy to increase the current or is it difficult? Say not increase, is it easy to change the current or is it difficult to change the current? It is very easy, right. You change the regulator, everybody has used a fan at home, change the regulator and old regulator, old fashioned regulator all it has is it has a resistance. In the regulators we have now it is an in inductance. So, just change the resistance in the circuit, you can change the current if voltage is constant, ohms law, right. So, it is very easy to uh, change the magnetic field. If you want to change from 11.7 Tesla to 21 Tesla that is not so easy, but if you want to change from 11.7 Tesla to say 13 Tesla at uh, and if you want to keep changing at resolution of 0 0.01 Tesla it is very easy ok. So, this second method is what is usually done you keep changing the magnetic field as uh, here it is the first method as the magnetic field changes what happens is the energy gap between alpha and beta changes and at different magnetic field values different protons come into resonance with this monochromatic radio frequency that is there in the machine ok. So, this is what is typically done rather than sweeping the uh, frequency. Are we clear? Are we clear? Is there any question? Can we go ahead? Ok. Then let us go ahead and say that nobody does this anymore. This is a classical way of recording NMR by using what is called CW method. What is used now is everybody records what is called FT NMR, Fourier transform NMR. Of course, in this course Fourier transformation is also something that is not new to us is not it. We are familiar with recording the data in time domain not only in frequency domain and we have discussed already towards the beginning of the course that time domain and frequency domain spectra actually have the same information ok. You can either have frequency on the x axis or have time on the x axis. So, this here is the depiction of a monochromatic wave in time domain same wave in frequency domain. Here we have a mixture of two colors two wavelengths in frequency domain the same thing in time domain. We have discussed inter interferograms and all that. So, we do not have to reopen that discussion. One thing that I did not write explicitly is how do you go from time domain to frequency domain? You go by doing Fourier transformation. These are the two relationships that allow you to go from time domain do data to frequency domain data or the other way around very, very easily. So, what is done nowadays and when I say nowadays I mean uh, quite a few decades is you do not use continuous wave rate radio frequency, you use pulses and you try to get time domain data, frequency transform it and get almost noise free good looking NMR data very quickly ok. So, that is what we will discuss in the next part, we will talk about uh, time domain NMR data.